Okay, so good morning. <laughs> Welcome everybody to our closing keynote for the last day of DevConf. Um, we have Jack Applebaum as a speaker today. He already gave a Q&A yesterday after the Citizen Four film and um, the video team managed to record it. So it will be put up if you missed that one. So you can listen to it later, I recommend that. But um, right, so now it's time for the keynote from Jack Applebaum, what is to be done? And please everybody welcome Jack Applebaum. <laughs> So um, first of all, I want to say thank you to everyone for having me here. It's really quite an honor to be back at DevConf. The last time that I really attended a DevConf was in Argentina in 2008, something like that in Mar del Plata. And it was a really good experience. Um, I spent many years in the new maintainer queue. I think I spent more years in the new maintainer queue than any other queue in my entire life. <laughs> and um, Debian is a really important community to me, and if it did not exist, I think a lot of the work that I have worked on in the last many years would not have been possible, or it would have been of much lesser quality. Um, I say that very lovingly towards other Linux distributions, but Debian, for me, has almost given me everything that I have needed for all of my computing needs, so that's really great. Um, I sort of wanted to try to do this in reverse, because I had the kind of hope that people would ask a lot of questions, and for those that came to the um, that came to the film last night and who asked questions, you know that I can talk for a really long time. And, uh, and I'm happy to do that, obviously. I have 45 minutes or something, 45 minutes and 31 seconds. So um, if anyone has any questions before I start, which is a little unorthodox for a keynote, I'd like to dynamically introduce whatever those questions are into the talk as I go because I would like the things that I say to be relevant because I have a lot of things that I could say and I had three cups of coffee, I'm on my fourth. So, <laughs> so if anyone has any questions now about any of the stuff from Citizen Four or if you just generally have some direction that you would like to see me go, I'd be very happy to hear it now. I know that's like exactly the opposite of what you would expect from a talk in the morning, but I kind of didn't just come here to talk, I also came here because I wanted to think about different things and I wanted to listen. So does anybody have any questions before I start? That went over as well as I'd hoped. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, so first of all, um, my work with Debian uh, is uh, very minimal at this point, but I have a couple of packages, some that I co-maintain, mostly with Alika and Holger. Um, and it's usually the case that I use Debian for other things, not just for developing Debian. And so the main stuff that I've worked on is relating to the Tor project, and that's helping to enable anonymity for all people on the planet without any exceptions whatsoever, and as a journalist and as, as an artist. And that's like a really weird combination, and in Germany, they can actually give you a visa for those three things, so they did. And, um, and so I've been working on a few different things, and one of the things is this free software art project, and I wanted to sort of show it as an example of something that I am not only proud of, but I think is a way to contextualize the issues of free software that we care about. Now this is in a museum in Spain called the Reina Sofia. I'm sorry for butchering that name in Spanish. My Spanish is really not great. Um, but this is a small free software powered device running Debian, GNU Linux. And it is a Novena board. And the Novena board is made by Bunny Huang. And he and Sean, who work on this device, made essentially um, this computer for the Tor project at one point because we thought we might like a router. It has since morphed into a uh, free software slash open hardware laptop, which is the Novena laptop. Some of you may be familiar with this. Um, but we, we took one of these uh, boards and essentially we turned it into a Tor relay that was a, was a middle node in the Reina Sofia. So what we decided was we wanted to have a computer that was in a museum that would create an open wireless network using free software, and then you would be able to join that wireless network in the museum, and it would route you dynamically through the Tor network, even if you didn't have <coughs> Tor software installed on your phone. So in a sense, you could visit the museum and have for 15, 20 minutes, or a month, however long you could stay in this museum, uh, you'd have access to the free and open internet. So even in places like in Germany, where we've also shown this, um, we, we have essentially uh, created open Wi-Fi where previously people wouldn't do that. And part of the reason they did, wouldn't do it is they were afraid of liability. And we thought that it would be important to try to align institutions with free software 
community values. And so this piece is called the Autonomy Cube. It's uh, in the sort of same spirit of uh, minimalist sculpture of uh, Hans Hacke. He also did, for example, uh, a thing called the Condensation Cube. And this is a sort of systems critique art piece where the entire cycle of condensation fits within this cube. So this is the Autonomy Cube. And the entire idea of autonomy here in theory fits inside of this cube, but in reality it only works when it's placed in an institution, when it's run in, uh, in a network with other people actually using it. Autonomy can't exist in isolation. It has to actually exist together with co cooperation, and at least in my view and in Trevor's view. This is a co-production with Mason Jude and Trevor Paglin and a number of other people. Um, so it's a Tor relay, and it's an open Wi-Fi network routing you through Tor. We, we installed this also at the, um, the, the, let's see, the, the Kunsthalle in Dusseldorf, uh, the Witte Witt in the Netherlands. Um, there's one at Metro Pictures in New York City. We showed it in San Francisco. So we've, we have a bunch of these. And um, we're currently working on one for the museum at Oldenburg. Uh, anyone here from Oldenburg by any chance? I guess nobody. Okay. Well, Oldenburg is a city in Germany that you may have never heard of. I hadn't. And um, they're really, really fantastic. And they have decided that they want to sponsor a four computer version of this. So it'll be four Novena boards as an autonomy cube, essentially creating an open Wi-Fi network for this museum in the city. And it's the whole museum. And then it will be a 200 megabit Tor exit node as well um, for the city of Oldenburg. And thus, this actually turns the city into a bastion of free speech on the internet as the art museum is a bastion of free speech in the physical world. And the idea is to join these institutions together where those values meet uh, in a physical space and use art. Because art is one of the places where we still have free expression in Western society, and I mean really free expression. And so this uh, piece of art, which I'll just leave up for the rest of the talk now, is kind of a reflection on trying to make free software do that, and also to give people the ability to bootstrap against mass surveillance by having these kinds of devices publicly available and openly and freely uh, in spaces that you can visit without suspicion. Right? If you go to your local anarchist squat, you may attract attention. If you go to the local art museum, you might not. Um, so we wanted to make sure that everyone had access to this. Um, so this, this, for me, touches on uh, the issue of autonomy, obviously, but this is fundamentally a core part of free software, which is self-control, informational self-determination, and essentially the ability to control the means of production with your own computer or the means of reproduction of information, as it were. Um, so this autonomy aspect is also very important in a journalistic context because it turns out that if you're working on things that you need to release in a very specific way, you need certain, basically, let's call them operational security uh, constraints to be met. And so one of the things that we have found is that using, for example, almost exactly this computer, and in some cases exactly this computer, for something completely different um, is that you can use it as a normal Debian operating platform. So you can use this, boot Debian, and you're actually good to go with a free software computer where you can pull the flashcard out and do verification on it. Um, so to that extent, um, I found that using very specific pieces of hardware will get you some part of the way towards having actual self-determination of information and the ability to do what I might call um, non-adversarial forensics. Um, this is a very important term. If someone steals your computer or if someone breaks into your computer, they can do what we would call adversarial forensics. They want to use your data against you and potentially they want to tamper with that data or they want to tamper with the programs on, on your computer or in memory in some way. And what we, in some of the work that we've done as journalists and as artists, Trevor has actually worked actually on not only this kind of art stuff, but he also helped work on Citizen 4, so he is a, a Tails user as well as a Debian user, as is Laura and other people that we worked on these things with. We needed to make sure that these systems that we're using, they have some sort of consistency. When we turn them off and turn them back on again, we're back to a new starting place if you replace the Tails disk, for example, if, if it were to be compromised. And for that, there's a whole bunch of things that either needed to be done or that we had to work around. And so part of what I'm hoping to express uh, today is um, a lot of positive intention and uh, very happy thoughts, but also some constructive criticism. Um, so I'll start with this, which is if you install Debian by default, you have a woefully insecure setup. By default, you have NFS and Avahi as an example uh, that really stand out. And what I was kind of hoping to suggest is that we might consider that people who don't understand Debian 
don't understand what that means. And as a result, people who install this software don't realize that the place that they start is in a place that is already vulnerable to mass surveillance. Broadcasting their machine's name, potentially allowing for people, if there were a single bug in the NFS utilities, not to suggest that there are, but if there were to be a single bug, these people might be susceptible to it. And people like Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras, for me, what's important is making sure that those kinds of people are safe by default. So of course, when I install Debian, I do a whole bunch of different things. One of those things is in, you know, getting rid of Avahi, which is actually significantly more difficult than you might think. And uh, <clears throat> like on, on many levels, there's like many different things that you can do that are not correct. And only, I think, two things that you can do that are correct that leave it in place, but it doesn't actually harm you anymore. Um, and of course, removing things like NFS, installing things like UFW, that's a sort of baseline just to have a normal Debian system. And once you're at that point, you can then go a little bit further to customize it. So for example, a GRSec enabled kernel, for those of you that are following along at home, drink. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's something which takes a lot of effort to actually do, but it's of course possible to do it. And what I would suggest is that we might consider that if we have these as options, for example, when an install is done, we actually do this set of things by default. That is, enable UFW, remove any listening services, and treat the network as hostile by default. That that actually moves forward the baseline for everybody's security. And people who know otherwise can actually take the steps of changing the way that the system works in order to meet their needs, which may be not so worried about, say, network surveillance. Uh, it may be the case that they're not so worried about authentication or any sort of other useful security properties. And that's, of course, they're right, but users who do not understand these things should actually have secure and private defaults. And when we have secure and private defaults, we increase everybody's actual autonomy, in my opinion. Um, and what we found was that, um, you know, preceding and things like that, of course, work, but it still takes specialized people. And what we want is to make it universal, and that means that it needs to be in the default. And that, of course, is a question of a whole community making that kind of decision to focus on those kinds of things. So I want to sort of put, uh, put two concepts forward. And one of them is that the network is hostile in really strange ways. So for example, not having TLS, uh, HTTP, uh, S, as it, as it were, Debian mirrors is actually a problem. But not because the data isn't authenticated, but because the way that systems of mass surveillance work is that they actually look for, in many cases, strings and use those strings as targeting information, which is then used to trigger particular activities. So let's say that you are downloading a new version of OpenSSL, or let's say that you're downloading a new version of apt or something like this. It's possibly the case that because there is no crypto between you and the package repository, someone will be able to do an exact uh, fingerprint of the thing that you are doing and be able to, in fact, exploit exactly that client before it is updated. So when there's a known security bug, you would, in fact, be automatically updating your packages in a reasonable way and the machine could get automatically compromised. This is, I think, a very key problem. And in this case, it's not that someone couldn't run a hostile mirror. It's that we believe, or I believe anyway, that not every single mirror will be hostile, and at scale, some people will be able to protect themselves. So there's a theory that the sort of perfection is really what we need to achieve, but what I think we need to think about is just how to achieve a sort of mass adoption that makes it economically infeasible for attackers to do that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a very straightforward and simple thing, which is that everything Debian does by default should be connecting to services that are encrypted. And if you want to do a man-in-the-middle attack on your own systems to be able to inspect traffic or understand what's happening, we should, of course, support that. But by default, it would make sense that we simply have strong crypto for all of these things. Now, there are some places where this is lacking. So for example, NTP is just a woefully insecure protocol from an era when you had to slide down a brontosaurus to use your fax machine. And this is necessary for secure clocks, um, but it is not sufficient. And we need to think of new ways to solve these problems that are usable without having to set a key or do something. Um, one of the packages that I have in Debian is called TLS date. It's the so-called secure uh, R, like R date like program. Um, and it has a, another program called TLS date D, which is a, a daemon that runs. And it connects to, sadly, a Google service, which supports uh, sending the clock through uh, the TLS date channel, which is part of the protocol. And this is actually used by Google Chrome OS to set the clock every single time a Google Chrome OS device comes online. Um, this is not a replacement for NTP, but it is a good start 
for being able to have at least secure network time to the one second accuracy resolution or so. Um, I don't think we should ship that by default in Debian necessarily, though that would be really fantastic. Um, I do think we should consider how we might go about treating the network as hostile while still having some semblance of actual uh, usability. So in the case of TLS state, um, you will be able to set a clock securely, but there's a trade-off, which is the resolution of time. And we need to think about how to revamp core protocols like NTP, but that's actually even bigger than the Debian project. Um, but nonetheless, I think we have to think about that. And if we imagine that we would audit a, a default Debian system, we would see a lot of stuff that leaks out onto the network, which is not encrypted or not authenticated, or potentially is processed by a program which runs as root. And that's a really big problem. Um, although some of these programs are, are moving in the direction of being sandboxed or not running as root, we should, I think, consider that as a, just a general priority that when something runs as root, it's a really juicy target. Uh, one of the saddest uh, pieces of uh, free software that runs as root that I've seen is uh, DHCP clients. Um, there are even, in some cases, patches for some DHCP clients, which for various reasons were not accepted upstream, and as a result, the DHCP clients, which are shipped in many Linux distributions today, still run as root, even though there was free software written to fix them to no longer run as root. And in some cases, they are contained with things like AppArmor, but this just isn't enough, in my opinion. So we should look to make sure that everything that touches the network is also not run as root. And this is something that, for some of the work that we did, we actually changed, we actually changed the way some of these programs worked. Um, right now, I'm working on a DHCP client with Dan Bernstein, and one of, the, uh, one of the goals is actually to make it so that it doesn't require raw uh, socket capability. And it turns out that it's really easy to do this in Linux by just turning off the, um, the path filtering, the reverse path filtering in the kernel. And so you don't actually need to be root and you don't actually need to have raw sockets and you just need to be able to generate a few packets and then to parse them. And then you can have a really like basically privilege free uh, DHCP client. And if we were to imagine setting that as the goal, actually getting there is really easy. Technically it's very simple stuff. Um, it's just not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily a big priority I would say. Um, so one of the other things that I found myself doing is jailing programs to make them either harder to exploit or to compartmentalize those programs such that they, um, if they were exploited, they would be significantly harder to leverage to compromise the rest of the computer. So I've used a little tool called Minijail, which is part of Chrome OS as well. And this allows you to write a sort of policy file of seccomp uh, filters. So you can say, this syscall is allowed with this argument. And you just have a text file, and then you run the program. And it can set things like namespaces, and you know, remount file systems and things, and essentially act as an init for the program. Um, and then, of course, combining that with AppArmor. So, for example, there's a program called Ricochet, and I recently uh, sandboxed this with Minijail. It has an AppArmor profile so that it can only read a very small set of files on the disk. And I actually then wrap that with Expra, which allows me to essentially have screen in X windows, which also means that if the program were exploited, it couldn't be used as an easy key logger um, while actually in the computer that I'm using. So it's, it's, it's actually running on this computer, but the X window that displays on my screen is an expert client. And the expert client is also jailed with AppArmor, and it's also uh, the case that it's jailed with Minijail. So even if you could exploit it to some degree, I think it's pretty good. The main problem, though, is that I still have an X server that is running as root, and that is not a fantastic thing. And of course, it's possible, I think, highly likely that there's some bugs in X. So. <laughs> Right? Um, there, there was a, like a kind of a funny story. Many, uh, many years ago, I was auditing Pigeon, which is a free software chat client some of you guys might use. And I found that there was a PNG that was malformed that you could feed to Pigeon and it actually would cause the X server to SIG7 as root, even though Pigeon itself was uh, jailed with AppArmor. So we have to think about how we containerize things because there are these unintended or completely obvious things in retrospect um, that are really, really quite dangerous. Um, but so that whole container process that I just mentioned, using Minijail and AppArmor and Expra, it's actually a total nightmare. So the, 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 the cost of this is that somebody adds a feature to the software and all of a sudden the, the Minijail profile doesn't work or AppArmor complains or it breaks something or Expra doesn't draw tooltips correctly and the entire screen is like really wedged in some strange way. Um, and Better is a framework which is being developed by some people from Subgraph called Oz where it basically automates all of this stuff. 
And the idea is to integrate seccomp policies, app armor, expra, namespaces, and the rest of this stuff, and you write a single policy, and this is installed on your system, and in the future there'll be some policy editing tools um, and some profile writing tools, and then that actually allows you to run things in containers. And I think we should work to containerize basically all of the applications that we need and to make them the sort of least authority or the least privileged principle, which I believe would be easier and would actually make it significantly more difficult to exploit some of these programs. But to that, to that end, the programs themselves need to have hardening so that the packages, when they're actually built, they have like, for example, stack smashing protection turned on, address sin, uh, sanitizer or ASAN, um, the uh, sort of GCC or Clang support for uh, <coughs> uninitialized behavior or UBSAN. Um, actually turning on those things has some performance overhead, but for the most part, I think it's clearly outweighed by the fact that if you have a web browser, it's the most likely vector into your computer. If you have a DHCP client, it may be the most likely vector into your computer if it was an old version of ISC DHCP, for example, just setting the host name to a command that you'd like executed was enough to get a remote root on most people's computers that ever use the software. And if we compartmentalize that software, we can actually say, well, we will never find all of those bugs, but we can mitigate, to a large extent, the actual impact that those bugs can have. And so that kind of compartmentalization is actually quite straightforward if we were to decide that it was worth doing. Um, so my suggestion here is that we do that. Pretty straightforward, it's a lot of work, but it's totally worth doing and it will actually reflect very well on a lot of the other things that are being done. Um, so um, moving down this list to actually make exploitation harder, um, I think that it's extremely important that we focus on things like having GRSEC and PACs so that it actually becomes the case that it's much more difficult to exploit, say, memory corruption vulnerabilities. And when you were to combine GRSEC and PACs with OZ, it's the case that it's really hard to exploit memory corruption vulnerabilities. And if you are able to, you have extensive logging that shows you what has happened, which gives you the ability to perform forensics on your own machine, so so-called non-adversarial forensics. So you can sort of step backwards in time. And I think those things are actually doable today if you want to spend about five hours, or if you have a fast computer, unlike me, um, if, you know, maybe like an hour or two, um, compiling this stuff and installing this stuff. Um, but then you have a problem, which is you've made a bunch of custom software on the machine, and uh, you've you know, installed this, and you've changed the system, and unless you're very careful, you won't have a record of all of this software. And if someone was able to successfully tamper with the machine or just in memory change some software by exploiting something, um, it would be, I think, extremely difficult uh, to know. I mean, you can't necessarily get a reproducible build of that kernel, maybe in the future. Um, so you won't know if the kernel has been tampered with on disk. So you need to create your own process, and then that process has to be perfect, essentially. Maybe you just copy all the files somewhere else and put them on a USB stick or burn them to a DVD and you don't think about it again. But what we should potentially consider is that that's a use case, which is taking your system offline and verifying it to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with. So this would again be a non-adversarial forensics process, which would allow you to know that your system was in a pristine state. Making that easy to do, so easy to do that it's in fact done by default as an install log, would be very helpful, potentially. Now there's some like time overhead for install information, but I think we should consider that that would be a useful thing. So when someone comes and says, hey, I'm a journalist working in the repressive regime of the United States of America, and I've had my house searched, and I think they touched my computer. Right now, you could hire someone maybe to help you with that process. Um, but even if they follow all of the uh, steps that, which we would like for a proper Debian install, they may not be able to easily verify, or we not, may not be able to easily verify everything that is on that system. And we should aim for being able to verify all of those things so that we can basically do differential analysis and see that some of those things have in fact been changed, but many of them are not, at least for what's on the disk. When we start to get into the territory of hardware, it becomes extremely difficult, right? We have the X60, we have the X61, and the S series of these. We have the X200 laptops. Um, we have basically no free software-powered computers that allow us to verify all the chips. Even in the X60, we have an open, um, uh, let's say, uh, idea of how the Renesis chips for the embedded controller work, but we don't have a free software embedded controller yet. Um, 
And even if we did have a free software controller, it's not clear that everyone has the correct hardware to be able to dump it and to verify it. So we need to move towards, again, this non-adversarial forensic way of doing analysis on our machines and not just on the disks um, and the data on the disks themselves. Um, but that said, we can compartmentalize some of these things down to smaller bits. So for example, with Debian, having an encrypted disk on machines potentially by default would allow us to make sure that we have a very small set of things that need to be looked at, which is the boot record as well as like an init RD or some sort of slash boot, uh, unless you're lucky enough to have a big flash chip where you can put that, all of that in your, uh, in your core boot payload. Um, and then essentially being able to boot that, um, being able to boot another disk to verify that means you have a very small set of things that you need to verify. And so short of firmware substitution attack on your drive, you'd actually have the ability to see that your system was safe to boot again. Um, but of course, there really is this firmware and this really is a serious problem. And the BIOS and the EFI of most systems, I think, are something that are problematic. So we need to think about how to verify that. So I can imagine that at install time, one thing that we might do on some systems is actually dump those things and store them on the system. So that if you were to, you'd, if you were to think you were compromised, you'd have an encrypted disk you could mount on another machine, and then you'd be able to dump this other machine that you started with and actually verify that information. Um, but sort of moving to a slightly different topic, um, yeah, I, w I wanted to suggest also um, that it is possible today that every single Debian system that gets installed can have a sort of like free, the equivalent of a free domain name. Pretty soon we're going to have an RFC that will certify .onion as being part of the special uh, names registry, which means it'll be reserved and ICANN won't be able to sell it. Um, and so if you install today uh, the Tor package made by Weasel here in the front row um, and comment out uh, two lines or uncomment two lines from the config file, you'll get a, what's called a Tor hidden service. And these Tor hidden services essentially allow for end-to-end -end anonymous communications. Um, now there are some trade-offs with this, but in short what it means is that if your computer is on the internet and Tor is able to connect to the network and bootstrap, you'll then, with those two lines being uncommented, if you also have a corresponding service like SSH or a web server or something, you'll have a, a name and you'll be able to connect to that name in Tor browser or on other systems that use Tor and in my case, on almost every Debian system that I use, uh, I basically uncomment those two lines and install SSH with SSH keys. And this means that no matter what happens, no matter how many NATs or firewalls are in between, if I'm able to get on the internet, um, it is the case that um, that machine will become reachable, which is a really nice feature. And so what I would propose is that you could give away at Debian install time an opt-in option where people can choose to have that. So this is almost the exact opposite, I think, of having NFS, right? You have the possibility of connecting to a secure service which is fully authenticated but also anonymized and is reachable for the whole world any, for every single person. And so then things just work. Now, there's some trade-offs there. One of them is that it's not exactly in the DNS. It's, in fact, exactly reserved to be out of the DNS. Um, but it does work, and it will allow for you to have reachability for that computer system if it is on the Internet. Um, so it's a humble suggestion, but the keys are free and there's no central registry. So it's really with the ethos of Debian, I feel. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network and it's a peer-to-peer -peer naming system and it works and it's secure in the sense that it's a cryptographic key. So as long as you control the private key, you have the ability to do what you like with it, which includes being a part of that uh, Tor Hidden Service network. Um, there's another project that I'd like to sort of talk about that I think is very important and it's called the GNUK. I don't know if Nibe is here. Um, oh, hello, great. Um, one of the problems that we encountered when working, especially on the Snowden files, is that if your computer is compromised, it's basically game over. Um, if the attackers are any good, everyone's always worried about the pre-exploitation and the exploitation state, so it's like they pop the web browser and then they're into the computer, and people sort of stop talking about it at that point. And what we need to do is to continue the discussion. And so to continue the discussion, what happens next is they exfiltrate your data. And it doesn't matter if you're using Tails. If they've popped your web browser, they send the data out over, over Tails, over Tor, no problem. That's a real problem. So what we need to actually move towards is open hardware and free software devices that actually store cryptographic information like a secret key or an SSH key or a GPG key of some kind. Um, and then we 
need to be able to fabricate those in diverse locations around the world. We need to be able to x-ray the boards to make sure that they're the same. We need to be able to verify uh, and actually audit the software that runs on it. And so it turns out that there exists a person who did exactly all of this work. And so these devices exist. And it's not the GNU PG token that G10 sells, the Werner Cox um, uh, company. Though I use those devices and I think they are good, I worry that Zeit Control, the company that makes it, or potentially um, through no fault of their own, there could be some sort of bug. Um, that stuff is very hard to audit and is significantly uh, more difficult to actually acquire. Um, right now, the, the, it's the FSTO one, right? Yeah. The, yeah, the FSTO one is uh, a device which is essentially a GNU PG smart card, but written all with free software, all with open hardware. And I think that we need to basically adopt these in the free software community so that every single person has the ability to improve their tokens and also has the ability to see that their token works as is expected. And we don't support proprietary companies who try to get developers to sign non-disclosure agreements, right? Non-disclosure agreements are non-free binding things that cause lots of problems, and we should not have anything to do with them if we can help it. And in this case, we can help it, because Nibay's work actually allows that uh, and creates that possibility. So I think um, I would really encourage everyone to basically support his project, because I think it's very important. And combined with Debian, it makes for um, basically a system where you can do certain things and have certain cryptographic properties. And even if someone can break into your computer, even if they get past GRSEC and PACS, they get past address sanitizer and app armor or whatever else, once they're in, they still have this barrier, which is the physical barrier, where at best they can use it as a crypto oracle. Um, so we should really, I think, work to support those things. And if you're a Debian developer that has a cryptographic key and it's sitting bare on a disk, I would really encourage you to just load it into one of these devices. They cost about, what, 25 euros or something like this. And it will make it so much harder to compromise Debian as a project, um, which moving along uh, is sort of coming towards uh, a really big concern that I have, which is when we were basing a lot of our work on using Debian, I worried that one thing that could happen would be that someone would try to coerce Debian developers and potentially into uploading a bad package or potentially they would break into the system and steal a key which would allow them to sign something that could be used and combined with the, the fact that we don't actually have end-to-end -end crypto for absolutely everything we do, it would be possible to fingerprint particular users and it would be possible to do a bunch of nasty stuff and the security that we base things on would actually just fall apart. Um, so I think we need to look at deterministic building of software so that we can verify that things in the archive are correct. And there's a lot of work being done by the deterministic build team. Um, I think a few people here in the room work on that, if you could raise your hand. So I just want to highlight that. Can you raise your hand like, for, so that more than I can see it? Thanks. Um, um, I want to highlight that work because I think it's very important. Um, one thing that we need to also consider and think about is probably this... Um, it's good for many reasons, and it solves many problems, but we also need to do analysis about how it might fail. For example, when the X2 exploit for SSH was written, does anybody remember this? There is a remote exploit in SSHD, and you could break into basically every system on the internet. One of the things you had to do in order to use that exploit, not that I did, but if you looked at it, you could see this, uh, um, was you needed to find the memory offsets. And in order to do that, you had to look at every single distribution of SSH. And even though you had a remote root exploit, if you had compiled things a little bit differently, at least that off-the-shelf uh, off standard exploit kit wouldn't work. Now, when we move to reproducible builds, it's not clear to me that we make that problem better. I think we actually make it significantly worse. So for example, we distribute the Tor browser as part of the Tor project as a reproducible build on Linux. And the memory offsets are basically all the same for everybody. And this is a Firefox fork, so you have a lot of problems to begin with. And then you have one set of memory offsets. Now, when you do binary distributions anyway, you always have this problem. But when an entire operating system moves in that direction, and many operating systems start to move in that direction, what have you done? I think we made exploitation easier, but we made binary substitution attacks harder. 
Um, but I think that with address-based randomization, with ASAN, UBSAN, and other things like this, we can actually still make exploitation significantly harder, and we can make binary substitution attacks significantly more difficult. So it's not, it's not lose-lose, but I think we just kind of need to think about what that would look like by writing some intentionally vulnerable software and then seeing how hard it would be to exploit, for example. Um, now I have about, I think, eight minutes or something before I have to stop, and so I'll stop pretty soon uh, after making a couple more points and then we can take some questions. Um, but I wanted to encourage packaging a few things. Um, one of those things uh, is uh, Ricochet, which is a peer-to-peer -peer instant messaging client that uses Tor Hidden Services. Uh, it has most of the build hardening stuff that, uh, that I've been mentioning and it's, it works today, it's server free and the buddy lists are on your computer. Um, I'm actually pretty impressed by it. It's an experimental system and it uses Qt uh, or Qt, I guess. Um, it's pretty nice despite that fact, or in cause of, because of that fact, depending on how you look at it, and it's very useful. Um, there are a couple of other programs which a lot of people on Debian tend to use, especially journalists that I work with, and one of them is Tor Browser, and there exists a program called Tor Browser-Launcher, which is in Contrib. That's a very useful, uh, uh, useful package. For the most part, it would be even better though if it was just Tor Browser properly and that we package Tor Browser by default because this is a, it is a maintained long-term Firefox fork and it is the case that it's reproducible by default. It's a very useful thing to have and it would be nice if that was just in Debian. Some people are working on these things. If you'd like to help, I think I can help coordinate with you or you can reach out to those people directly. Um, Additionally, there are a couple of other useful things that I think we need, and one of them is a Jabber client that actually has OTR by default, enabled and on, so that when people chat by default, they're opportunistically secure and safe. One of the properties OTR gives you is a thing called forward secrecy, which means that if someone were, say, performing dragnet surveillance on the whole internet, let's say that that's happening, um, <laughs> then it would be the case that when they see your chats, it would be encrypted. They'd have to do work to try to break it. It's possible that in the future, OTR's 1536-bit prime will not be good enough, but it sure seems good enough today. Uh, last uh, December, we actually disclosed what are called FISA intercepts. That's where the US government targets people for various different reasons, and we saw that they could not decrypt OTR sessions, which was great, in my opinion. Maybe not for those specific people, but it was great for validating the mathematical protections that things like OTR provide. Um, so I think we should actually have a Jabber client that does that. But we also need to think about type safe programs as well. It's not enough just to have crypto, we need to actually make it harder to exploit. So there's a thing called XMPP client, which is sort of the ed of Jabber clients. Uh, like it's, that's actually perhaps too forgiving. It's a little harder to use than ed. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, it has some tab completion, so it's not that bad. But um, if you've ever used it, you understand what I'm talking about. It's literally line by line, and you tab complete people's names, and someone will talk to you, and if you type in response, you're talking to someone else completely, potentially. Um, so packaging stuff like that, I'll probably package that in the near future because everybody needs ed of XMPP clients. Um, but it has a pure Go OTR implementation, which I think is all right. It probably has some problems. Um, but it's potentially better than using something like um, libpurple, which has incredible amounts of problems. Um, and in the future, it will get better, but it's still good to have diversity. And one of the things that we should consider is not just diversity of the software itself, but how the software is written and distributed. And so having some stuff in Golang is nice because people still, myself included, do not know how to write in C safely, and that's a problem. And people who think they do are probably wrong. Um, and you can check by looking at the CV count for their software project. The CVE count is often not zero. Um, another useful piece of software is Pond, and this is a delayed uh, messaging system which is a little bit like email, but it's all over Tor Hidden Services, and you can send files with, without really a lot of metadata, almost no metadata. One of the things is that you can create your own Pond servers with your own file attachments. Um, we designed a key exchange method for it, which is called Panda, and Panda is um, a design that I came up with in discussions with Adam Langley that essentially allows you to do a forward secret key exchange, but it also allows you to discover information. So when you meet with someone, we call it pawn bonding. Uh, we couldn't come up with a better name, but when you pawn bond with somebody, um, you essentially give them a shared secret, and this is used as part of an encrypted key exchange, and that actually encrypts part of a Diffie-Hellman, and then the actual data that you send, such as uh, like a private group key along with your addresses, um, that's actually encrypted with a symmetric cipher, 
Um, and that data is uh, encrypted with a key, which is part of a Diffie-Hellman. And so the Diffie-Hellman needs to be encrypted, and that's what the phrase is for. And, and that phrase only needs to last for a very short period of time. Um, and even if someone guesses that phrase at some point, you say you use like Bananarama Ding Dong as the passphrase, not a super great passphrase, um, but it only needs to last for five minutes, so that's actually maybe an okay passphrase. Um, then you've done the Diffie-Hellman, you've downloaded the ciphertext, you've done a key exchange, you've done the, the discovery, and you're actually finished. Now you're bonded up, and you have a system where there's no spam because you have to have a group private key to be able to inject messages into people's queues. And so it's actually a little bit different than email. Um, I would really encourage looking at it and especially helping. And if you're interested in helping to package it, it could be quite useful. Um, and then sort of finally and generally, Tor as a project has a lot of pluggable transports that I think we could use help with in terms of packaging. And the main reason is that I think that we are moving towards a world where there's a lot of censorship and surveillance. And it would be nice if Debian had a Tor for bootstrapping in every even if it's not running, available for every person in some way, maybe installed on the system if they need it. And that would tie it together nicely with having an end-to-end -end reachable host name. Um, that kind of stuff, I think, takes us towards a future where we're more resistant to metadata surveillance, where it's harder to exploit the computers, where it's harder to find the computers and the details about them to exploit them. And potentially, with a little bit more openness, like with a binary transparency uh, project, tied together with reproducible builds, it becomes extremely difficult to target people without leaving behind information that allows you to catch them and to improve the system. Um, so I think that almost entirely covers everything I wanted to talk about. Um, and I have a few minutes left, I think, for questions. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, first question there. Um, thank you very much for the talks. And uh, my question resonates more probably with yesterday's movie and beginning of your talk. We shouldn't forget that we live, it's not just white and black, right? We don't have governments only to survey us, right? So they're trying to solve real problems, how to limit those parasites in our society, right, who also kind of benefit from our existence by, you know, trafficking guns, human trafficking, all that stuff. By improving our, not just by improving our privacy, but by creating those technological advances, we are helping those as well, right? So it's kind of vicious circle or backfire always. And mm. in your talks, I haven't spot a single note of that other side. Right, which we are also fostering those illegal activities of. Mm. Right, so how do you, do you we as society could develop techniques, maybe just you know civil awareness, how we could help actually our governments, which are created by us, right, to fight this evil, actually evil side. Mm. Thank you. So I, I think that's a totally valid question, and I, I hear it quite often, and I just want to echo, I think that there are people who use free software for bad stuff. I've met police officers, for example, that commit acts of police brutality, but they use computers. Serious problem. I don't know how we deal with this criminal element in our society, right? If you've ever been to a protest and you've been beaten up by a cop, you know what I'm talking about, right? There are people who, in theory, are part of society, but in practice, they do things that are outside of society. So how do we deal with that? I actually think that what Debian is doing is the correct thing, which is you make free software that is not purpose limited so that every person without exception has software freedom. And that has some downsides. And one of the downsides is that the US military will use free software to kill your family members if you are in a country where there is a war and you are declared as the enemy. I think that sucks. But maybe if we design Debian in a way that makes it very difficult for them to do metadata analysis, they will be less likely to use computers as the vector for targeting you for a drone strike for example. So there is incredible terrorist activity relating to war mongering, especially if you look at Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq. And what you'll find is that surveillance is actually used to enable war. Now, in the case of the Iraq war, we killed somewhere between 100,000 and a million people. That's a lot more than Al Qaeda has ever managed to kill, actually. So if we talk about it, terrorism as bad guys or people running guns, remember that the US State Department runs guns, right? Remember that the US military bombs children, that the Israeli military bombs children in Gaza. 
What we want to do is improve everyone's situation, and potentially that can help us to reduce the total amount of war and suffering in the world. Trying to pick sides in that, I think, where we would add a back door, or where we would pretend that somehow bad guys won't get these protections, bad guys won't get these protections, it's a total disaster. It's a failure. And instead, what we should do is try to enable every person, and to enable their liberty actually raises them above the position where they are, where they would want to take those actions. The exception being really militarized governments, actually. I don't know how we solve that problem, but I do think that we shouldn't do it while we harm every person else using Debian or other free software projects. And so, of course, there are downsides. Of course, there are cases where surveillance is useful. For example, when we look at HSBC or other drug trafficking banks, it would have been really great if we'd been able to take those banks down for their illegal activities. Those are, you know, that's an international criminal conspiracy, and they got away with it. But probably, your ability to organize against those banks will be significantly better if you have free software that protects you. And those guys are going to have that protection whether or not you want them to or not, in fact. And I'm glad that you have faith in your government, but I have almost no faith in my government. So what I would like is to build a transnational system where we respect each other's human rights, and that's reflected in the software that we use and reflected in the processes where we treat each other as equal, not based on national, let's say, where you were born versus where I'm born, whether or not we have universal rights. Debian is a universal operating system, which in recognizing universality actually suggests that we should think about other things like universal human rights. And I really think it's important to not ever sacrifice that because that principle is, I mean, that's a hard won principle, especially in the 20th century. And in the 21st century, that's true as well. So we really, I would really encourage you to think that the net positive output of this is in fact good for all of humanity, even though some cops who beat up protesters may use free software, even though some militaries may bomb women and children in, in, in war zones, we will be better off with free software for every person, and we will be better off securing communications and reducing the attack service for all the people on the planet, even though some of those bad guys will use free software. So. <laughs> So there was a question from IRC. Um, where is it? Ta -da. Yeah. Um, do you know about the built-in security features in System D, which allow to lock down services using SecCom filters, remove access to files, networks, etc.? Is that uh, on your list of things, or are you working with that? Um, I I do know about that. I mean, uh, I think this is a religious war that's about to start. <laughs> um, uh, um, I, yeah, <laughs> you're over it, huh? Um, <laughs> that's great. Um, so, all right, I'll declare, I'll declare which camp I'm in. I think System D is a really good idea, and it solves a lot of problems that we have had, and it adds some new problems. But one of the problems that it solves is the ability to actually have reliable services that are restarted and that are compartmentalized from outside of the service in a non-hackish way that becomes a supportive part of the operating system. And for all of the downsides that come with System D, I suspect that if we really drill down and focus and compartmentalize software as part of the base system, it will be seriously difficult to exploit and to gain a foothold in those free software systems. <coughs> One hopes. And I'd like to actually see um, you know, System D essentially, um, I don't want to say take over the world, but I'd like System D's security properties to be the de facto go-to place for these kinds of things so that when we're doing any service, not just a system service, um, we can have certain things restart, uh, debug them automatically in useful ways, gather information. Uh, and so I'm very supportive that, of that. And for example, um, Leonard Potter, I think, is the person I spoke to at the System D project. Harry he, Potter. not Harry Potter. Um, <laughs> that's not nice. Um, Harry Potter is not as good at system D programming. Um, I showed him that there was a keystroke uh, kind of or a key injector device. So some forensics people, when they steal your computer, um, right before they steal your computer, they plug in this USB device. It's called a mouse jiggler, and it keeps the screen from locking. So I showed this to these guys, and I told them, hey, here's the IDs. Uh, I put them online. Um, could you add to System D the ability that when someone plugs in this mouse jiggler, it automatically locks all the screens instead of keeping the screens unlocked? And they added that and pushed it out to System D. I don't think anybody noticed that, except for maybe the forensics guys the first time they plugged it in. Yeah. 
So yeah, we, we were principal builds. We're um, closing a loop where uh, some build demons or developers machine could be compromised and they will send bad things to the world without even noticing. Uh, I'm, and we, we, it's great. Uh, I'm starting to worry about the next step, which is, oh, you developer, I'm going to threaten you of, of with torture. So you will compromise your own package. Uh, and I'd like to uh, know what, what, should we switch to like mandatory review of any packages that have like popcorn of a thousand or something? Yeah, I, I don't know about mandatory review, but I think that you're right. So um, in the political strategy that we need to consider for the work that we're doing, and there is a political component, right? Free software is fundamentally a political thing, and the Debian project is probably one of the best organized, most transparent political organizations I've ever seen in my life, actually. And I mean, it's really impressive. I mean, the new maintainer queue is a painful hazing process, but it, is a, it, it was at the time a useful hazing process. I still have scars from it. Um, but if we, if we think about it, reproducible builds are one step down the line, and doing code review is another step down the line, and from that, things like binary transparency are another thing down the line, and so on and so forth, right? So we need automated QA tools to look over the entire archive of binaries, if we can, for both reverse engineering purposes, uh, but also we need to have source code review. And I don't know if it's 1,000 people installing it with Popcon or something like this. Like it, it's not entirely clear to me what that threshold is. But having easy to use, easy, verified, open, transparent systems, like for example, the Garrett uh, tool where people do code review, is really, really useful. Um, when you can make it as low a friction experience as possible, I think that that actually is a better thing. And we should aim towards that. It should be possible to look at a package very easily. This is actually something there's been a lot of progress made on. Um, but to be able to look or to upload a deb and have it like tell you where everything is, what the git repo is, what the hashes are, that would be fantastic. And I think that if we can do mandatory source code review, that's great. If we just have the ability to do that at all, it would be a really good start um, where it's somehow integrated into the workflow. So combine that with a non-adversarial forensics and you really have, a, you've made a lot of progress. It becomes the case that it's much easier to backdoor the BIOS or the embedded controller or some chip than Debian. Debian is no longer the weakest link. Um, and I think that that would be powerful and I think it will also be helpful to people, especially if they work on free software in places where they might be coerced. Um, it's definitely the case that I think if you live in the United States, that you at least in theory have good constitutional protections, but in practice you might get a secret letter that orders you to do a thing. And I don't think it's reasonable to expect people to destroy their lives. So I think what we need to do is change the incentives so that if someone is forced, that we catch them and actually, if possible, we should continue to support them, right? When people are forced, we should not punish them. And that's another important thing. So we should try to make sure that we can find out when bad things are happening and continue to be a strong community that pulls tighter together as opposed to being pushed further apart, right? So like no name calling or threatening or anything bad like that, but just work to support and assume good faith about that. And I think a code review system like that would really help. And I hope that that was you volunteering to build it, Lunar. So we have time for one last quick question, I guess. So you mentioned AppArmor several times um, during your, uh, your, your talk, yep. but not SE Linux even once. Is that deliberate? Um, <laughs> uh, so we have time for another question. <laughs> um, um, uh, I mean, maybe. Uh, the, the answer is, um, I think that AppArmor works today, and it's not very good compared to some other things, but I think that it's much better than nothing at all, and we should move on that and migrate as we go. Uh, and AppArmor does have some useful constraining policies. Um, so I think they're good, but I would prefer to have much more fine-grained control. Um, one thing that really worries me about AppArmor, for example, is that you can limit network activity, but only in the sense that you're allowed to create a TCP connection or UDP uh, socket of some kind, and it would be nice if you could actually without using the firewall, have defense in depth. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's good, and it's deployed today, and I use it on a bunch of Debian systems, and that makes me quite happy. Um, SE Linux, it's not bad, and it, just because the NSA touched it, created it, audited it, funded it, and so on, that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, right? They have some good people, like the people that clean the toilets at the NSA are probably also fantastic, and we shouldn't blame them for the transgressions of other people. Um, but I am super skeptical of it. And also, if it's not really easy to use, if it's not standard, I feel like we don't have enough eyes on it. 
Um, but it may be fine, right? A lot of other uh, distributions use it. Um, so I don't think we should not use it, but I do think AppArmor works today, so we should consider continuing to use it and to extend it while we are using that. And we should continue to do more things like that. And we shouldn't just pick one, we should pick many. So systemd plus AppArmor or MiniJail and AppArmor or SE Linux or these kinds of things, we should try to figure out how to actually um, limit the way that our systems can be compromised and limit the, the, the compartments that are compartmentalized down to security domains and actually use them. So something is better than nothing would be the best way to answer that. Yeah. Are you happy to take more questions outside? We just have, we have to cut it now. Yep, I'm happy to. Oh, so, thank you. so um, we have to cut it now. Time's over, but um, Jake is happy to take more questions. I would say it's nice outside over there. Just convene and, and talk to him. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.